Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. Well, today I'm going to answer one of those questions that folks keep asking me time and again. Is it possible to use DC and DCC on the same layout at the same time? So, let's go ahead and take a look at that. Now before we do get started with the topic on using DC and DCC, I have a couple of things that I want to uh, share with you. One about cameras, my cameras in particular, and also about lightning because summertime is the season of thunderstorms and get ready. And for those of you who aren't interested in hearing what I have to say about my cameras and lightning, you can jump ahead. I will put a timestamp here at the bottom of the video where you can go ahead and advance to using the scroll bar at the bottom of the screen and you can go forward to the point where I start uh, on the subject of using DC and DCC together. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what I've got here. For the last four years I've been using these two Sony camcorders. One of them has died on me three times in that period. The other has died on me twice. So, I don't have a backup camera anymore. All I have is a single 4K Sony camera that I picked up last December. So right now I am running without a backup. If something goes wrong with the camera that I'm shooting with now, then I'm in trouble. Fortunately, that particular one is still under warranty until December, so I will have an opportunity to get it fixed for free. But if it does go, then I might be down for a week or two while I try to procure a backup camera for that because I'm not going to buy it now. I'm going to wait until the situation presents itself and I have to act because I have been burned several times with these two cameras and it's always the same failure. So there is something inherently wrong with this camera design. I am looking now at what I'm going to replace the next one with because eventually it will happen because Murphy's Law pops up all the time. Murphy liked to say, if it can happen, it eventually will happen, and at the most inopportune moment. So if a, if a Friday comes along and a video isn't there, it's probably because the camera that I'm shooting with right now has also died. A week ago, last Saturday, I got hit with a lightning strike behind the house here. It hit a tree about 20 feet behind the house. Fortunately, it didn't knock out the tree. It just stripped off a little bit of bark. But the electronic discharge did some damage here in the house. Fortunately, we have a whole house suppressor in the main circuit box, so it took care of most of the problem. But unfortunately, the main circuit here in the basement did get zapped, and as a result, I lost some equipment. Specifically, this is my 12 volt DC 10 amp power supply. It no longer works. Also, my DCS240 from Digitrex. It got zapped, it was on the same circuit as well. And unfortunately, it's got to go back to Digitrex for some repairs. The USB port is dead, plus there's a couple of functions that don't work properly. So that's going to go back to Digitrex for repair. The other thing I lost was my Windows laptop that I use for a lot of my model railroading. I use it for Decoder Pro, I use it for Loc Programmer, that kind of stuff. So. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to pick up an El Cheapy fairly quickly off of Amazon to get back in shape on that. Fortunately, I had backed up my roster recently, so I'm not going to have to do a lot of work to bring my roster up to date. I can just download it from my Dropbox account. Now, part of my problem was this guy right here. I had those all plugged into this one strip here. I thought this was a surge suppressor. It's not. It's just a power strip. Make sure that if you've got your electronic equipment plugged into something like this, that it has a surge suppressor built in. If, you're, if you don't have a surge suppressor, get one fast. Because right now, it's you know the time of the year when thunderstorms happen, and eventually a lightning strike will catch up with you too. You know I've been living on borrowed time for quite a while, but I finally got caught. So that's all I have to say about lightning strikes and cameras. Let's go ahead and move on with the rest of the video. Hit that little red uh, subscribe button and when the little bell comes up, click on it and click all. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about using DC and DCC together on the same layout. Now, 
anybody who has been around electronics for any amount of time knows that when you attempt to use two different types of power together on the same circuit, things can go wrong. And that is very true for using DC and DCC. So you have to be very, very careful when you're trying to mix these. It is not something that can be done without a little bit of thought and preparation. Or you run the risk of blowing your booster or your DC power pack. One or the other is not going to be very happy if the power between these two gets mixed in an uncontrolled manner. Now, what I want to do is turn this around and show you one safe way that you can go about using DC and DCC together on the same layout. Okay, so what I have here then is an old MRC Tech 4 260 uh, power pack, DC power pack, and a Digitrax DCS 200 command station booster capable of putting out 8 amps. Now, how can you mix those together on the same layout? Well, pretty simple. In this case, what I've got here is a standard double pull, double throw switch. And I have connected the output from the Tech 4 DC power pack to one set of poles here. I have run the output from the Digitrex command station booster to the other set of poles here. Then I have the yellow wires coming out and going to the track. So all I have to do, now this is a center off switch, which means in the center position, power is off from both sides. So there's no power being supplied to the track when this is in the center position. Now, if I throw the switch this way, then I'm going to have power from my Tech 4 DC power going to my track. So I'll be able to use the DC power pack to control my analog trains and also DCC locomotives that are operating in analog conversion mode. And I've talked about analog conversion in the past and how you can change that. It's in CV29, so I'll put a link to that video here so you can go back and take a look at how you can set your locomotives up so that they will convert to DC when they are placed on a DC powered track. And by the way, that is the default setup when you get a locomotive new from a manufacturer with a decoder in it. The other way that you can do this then is throw the switch to the other pole and you will have DCC power being supplied to the track. So what this means is then in the center off position, no power is going to the track. In one position, you have DCC power being supplied to the track. Throw it the other way and you have DC power being supplied to your track. So that is the easiest, simplest, safest method in order to use DC and DCC together on the same layout. All you have to do is hook your two wires from the switch up to your main power bus and throw the switch whichever you want to run. You can run DC and DCC with analog conversion or you can run DCC alone. So it's pretty straightforward, easy way to do it and it is safe because power is always one or the other. You can't have both DC and DCC provided to the track at the same time with this approach. So this is the one that I would recommend if you haven't made up your mind yet about permanently switching your model railroad over, then this is the way to go. Now one of the problems that you do have to worry about though is you cannot use accessories on your model railroad that only operate with DCC. So, frog juicers, for example, are DCC only. You cannot use a frog juicer on your layout until you go completely with DCC. So keep that in mind. And there will be a lot of other things that will only operate with DCC power, and you should not have them on a DC powered track. They are not compatible with it. Check the instructions. Make sure before you install them, because you don't want to blow something that you just bought. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the second method that you can employ. And you'll excuse this very simplified diagram, but it's all I could put together now that my Windows computer is crapped out and the software that I would normally use for this is not available. So what we have here then is what I call a loop in a loop approach. So you would have one loop of track that would be DC powered, and then you have another loop that is set up with DCC power. So this approach then allows you to be able to control and power 
your trains using either DCC or DC power. At the same time, because they are totally isolated, you cannot have any crossover power between these two loops. Therefore, it is a very, very safe way to do it. And I've known clubs that do this where they will have a large loop that might be DC powered and a smaller loop inside of it that is DCC powered. And this can be any configuration. It doesn't need to be a loop as long as the two halves of the model railroad are physically and electronically isolated. So again, you cannot have any crossover power. But this does mean that your DC power people can operate their trains at the same time that the DCC guys do. So no question at all that you're not going to have any problems with this. You're not going to blow out any boosters or any power supplies using this approach. At my old club in Virginia, we used to have a very large loop that went around the entire area and represented the uh, Atlanta to Washington DC main line. And then within the loop, we had the rest of the entire layout that was under DCC control. So that's one good way to go about doing this. But what if you want some way to be able to share rolling stock between the two loops that you're working with or the two sections of the layout? Well, one way is to put an interchange track between the two loops and cut gaps at each end of that interchange track. That way, the interchange track can be electronically dead. So you can throw the switch, push a cut of cars onto the interchange track, and then the DC locomotive could pick up that set of cars and move out with it without any crossover power connections at all. Now, the thing you have to watch out for this is that if you have passenger cars, for example, that are powered by track power, then you have to be careful that they are not so long that they cross the gap at both ends of your interchange. But that can also happen with two cars that are running together, such as a passenger train, and all of them are lit because power from one can be crossed over onto the dead section in the middle, and then a passenger car there can then pass that electricity onto the DC track on the outside. So that's one thing you have to be very careful of. This interchange track has to be long enough so that you do not have that occur. So two passenger car links probably is probably what you would want for that kind of thing. If you're just using 40 foot box cars, something like that, and there's no power connection between them or any power pickup at all, then you probably won't have any problems using this kind of an approach. Well, that's a wrap for today's video. I hope you take to heart all of my warnings about lightning strikes, buying Sony cameras, and also using DC and DCC together on the same model railroad. Now, as I said in the video, the method that I recommend the most is the loop within a loop because it's physically isolated completely or going with the double pole, double throw switch. And make sure if you get a double pole, double throw switch, it has that center off position. Because that means when you go from one form of power, such as DC to DCC, you have to turn power off to the track in between. Because when you flip that switch, it goes through a power off position. So think about that. Go ahead, follow my instructions, be safe, and enjoy your model railroading. Now also, one other thing I will recommend, instead of trying to mix DC and DCC together, go ahead, make the commitment to convert to DCC. And the most inexpensive method to do that is by factory installed decoder equipped locomotives. And the reason is that because of economy of scale, manufacturers can put in a decoder that is going to be tweaked for that particular locomotive at a lower cost point than you can actually do it yourself unless you've got a wholesaler willing to sell to you. Now, of course, the problem with that is in many cases, you might not be able to get the decoder that you particularly like. You might like a Tsunami uh, decoder instead of a Loke sound. So in those cases, buy the DCC ready version and be prepared to go through the steps of installing that decoder in that locomotive. It'll be a little bit more expensive, but at least you'll get the sound that you want and the type of operations you want. So that's it for today. Have a great weekend, have a great week, and hopefully I'll see you here next week, assuming this camera holds up better than the other two Sonys that I'm about ready to toss in the trash. So have a great one. Bye now.